action items um, and then we can move on with our first um, part of our agenda. So um, welcome everyone. I'm Mark Nod. I'm the chair of the Vermont Citizens Advisory Committee on Lake Champlain's future. It's March 14th, um, 5.05. Apologies for corralling all of you on the first day of daylight savings time when the sunshine is begging us to go outside and play. But um, uh, we'll have to do a better job scheduling in the future. <laughs> um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, I guess my first comment is to apologize for my technical difficulties over the last month as we had meetings and then um, uh, were in front of the legislative committees. And I appreciate all of you for um, taking the lead and the charge on those presentations. Um, I think it went well. We can we'll discuss that uh, towards the end of our meeting today. Um, I see a number of people, a uh, number of uh, public on, and so I'd like to move now to provide the opportunity for any public comment, and then we'll go to our a uh, few business action items before we move on to the first presentation. Is there anyone of the public that'd like to make any public comment before we get started? Okay. Oh, and there's Hillary's joined us also. Terrific. Um, So uh, our first action item is to review the draft meeting summary of January 10th. I couldn't attend that. Um, I know Denise is, I think she's on the line though. I know she told me she's, she's transporting a child. So if someone could make a motion to accept the draft meeting summary as presented and we can have any discussion and revisions. Wayne and Carol. Um, as I said, I, I missed that. I've read through them. Are there any comments or any revisions anyone would like to make to those uh, that meeting summary? OK, if not, I guess uh, any other abstentions? We'll do the easy part first. Um, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as presented? Unanimous. Any opposed? Thank you. The next, uh, I guess the next piece of business is uh, to move on to our round goby response update. Um, I know Meg is on and William Cook to give us a, uh, a an update on round goby. I know there was some recent press related to some considerations about the canal system. So um, Meg, I will just uh, let you take it from here. OK, thanks, Mark. Um... Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on. So I'm here to give you an update on the status of our Champlain Canal Barrier Feasibility Study. Um, this was work that is looking at the long-term all taxa approach um, to preventing the interbasin transfer of aquatic invasive species through the Champlain Canal. Um, and also uh, talk a little bit about how round goby plays into that, um, that plan or that response. So. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and you can let me know if you can see it. Really? Let's see. You got me? Yep, we see it. Thank you. I can't see you, so it helps verbally. <laughs> um, all right, great. So 
Um, the Round Goby and the Champlain Canal. So we, the Lake Champlain Basin Program and many partners, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Lake Champlain Sea Grant, University of Vermont, New York State DEC, Vermont DEC, um, even Quebec Ministry of Environment have been all engaged and involved in looking at <clears throat> the Champlain Canal as a pathway of interbasin transfer of invasive species. It's the pathway um, through which we don't have any spread prevention measures in place. Um, and we spend a lot of our resources um, working on other pathways like overland transport on boats and trailers with our boat steward and boat inspection program um, with uh, regulations for bait bucket transfers or introductions and certified bait purchase um, and uh, basically regulation of species that we don't want purchased or sold or moved um, through the Lacey Act and through other state regulated species. Um, but the long-term work of the Champlain Canal Barrier Study, um, which is identified in the Water Resources Development Act 5146, um, we took the first step on in executing a contract in 2017. Um, we tried to transfer funding secured by Senator Leahy from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission to serve as local match through our Lake Champlain Army Corps of Engineers Watershed Assistance Program called Section 542, which requires a 35% match um, to move forward with a project. Um, so we decided with the Army Corps and with the New York State Canal Corporation and New York State DEC at the time that the best way to move forward was for the Basin Program and New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission, our fiscal agent, to serve as a local sponsor and enter into a contract. So the 2017 project had a number of delays in going to contract. It has also had delays due to COVID, um, but the final report, Dr. Howe and I have been promised is due at the end of the week, um, which is very exciting because then we can share what's in that report. Um, so this has all been elevated by the fact that USGS New York has been tracking the movement of the Round Gobi through the Erie Canal system in New York eastward, um, and it has been recently detected as of July of last year at the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson Rivers. Um, this is pretty alarming to our um, fisheries biologists and other community members in the Lake Champlain watershed because the threat of a round goby introduction to Lake Champlain um, would be <clears throat> in it would be concerning. We don't know exactly what the impacts would be, but we have lots of impacts documented in other bodies of water in which they have invaded. So as a reminder, the Lake Champlain Basin Program has a rapid response task force. Our steering committee appoints members to that task force, and they have select representatives from the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources in Fish and Wildlife and in the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, within the Quebec Ministry of Environment um, in New York in the Adirondack Park Agency and within New York State DEC. And we have U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the task force as well. So we began a response looking at the threat um, of that round goby movement from the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson Rivers down here as it's moved eastward through the Erie Canal. And that distance between there moving up to uh, the, the Champlain Canal and possibly north into Lake Champlain. So the round goby, for those of you who are unaware, is a non-native fish that has caused some substantial ecological and economic impacts in the Great Lakes and other bodies of water. It originates from Eurasia. Um, it was first detected in the St. Clair River in 1990, and it was introduced via contaminated ballast water of transoceanic vessels into uh, the Great Lakes system. Since then, it has expanded um, throughout the Great Lakes, and there have been a number of other uh, introductions uh, since there, but it has moved um, from the Great Lakes east across the system and is now much closer to us um, in the Hudson River. So the ecological uh, fishery and human impact concerns that our rapid response task force is evaluating, they look at ecological economic impacts and the likelihood of any type of management possibility um, by doing a species evaluation questionnaire, it's otherwise known as a risk assessment. Um, and we've been coordinating with partners um, in Ontario who have had uh, introductions of round goby in Lake Oneida, 
um, as well as um, the prevention of the introduction of round goby into Lake Winnebago in Wisconsin by shutting down um, their lock system on, on the Fox River and their locks there. So for ecological effects, the round goby is a really aggressive egg eater. So it's likely um, to eat a lot of eggs of species uh, in our fishery that we uh, value, such as um, the likelihood of eating trout eggs, um, bass eggs. They will directly outcompete a lot of our benthic spe species, including sculpins, darters, stone cat, and log perch. Um, <clears throat> They're known to carry a number of pathogens, including viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Um, that's a pathogen that can affect over 25 different species of freshwater fish. And it is the whole reason why we instigated our emergency bait fish regulations in the late 2000s. Um, there are also impacts documented of moving and altering the flow of energy and nutrients in the Great Lakes. Round gobies do consume zebra mussels and they move a lot of the contaminants that zebra mussels filter out of the water system and pseudo feces on the benthic substrate of the food web. Um, and there is concern about that. And some of you may be aware of a few cases of avian botulism in the Great Lakes as well. And round goby plays a pretty critical link in that chain. Um, there are other possible impacts of round goby moving contaminants up the food web and maybe impacting um, the, the fish that eventually uh, we will eat as humans, um, but they're most likely to change the everyday angling experience in Lake Champlain. They can grow in pretty great densities, so when you go fishing for your desired fish, it may be one of the only fish that you end up catching. They aggressively eat uh, bait fish, um, and so there's been a lot of complaints about um, anglers going to fish and not being able to catch what they want. Um, there is discussion amongst the bass fishing community that round goby might be a positive impact to Lake Champlain because bass do eat round goby. Um, there has been clear documentation that round goby do eat bass um, eggs. And um, in some cases in, in the Great Lakes, they've had to actually change the bass fishing season um, because it used to be from ice out, which exists in Lake Champlain currently until after the bass nesting season. But in the catch and release um, early season, if you remove any of the adults off of the nest, um, round goby can get in and eat the eggs in the time it takes to catch it, take your photograph, release it, the bass regains orientation, returns to the nest, and the bass has already, or the round goby has already eaten the bass eggs. So bass may increase in size if round goby enter Lake Champlain, but there is going to be direct competition for bass eggs. Um, let's see. So in terms of entry points for non-native species to Lake Champlain, Again, many of you are very familiar with our State of the Lake report, and you know that we have 51 known non-native and invasive species in Lake Champlain, 87 in the St. Lawrence Seaway, 188 in the Great Lakes, and 122 in the Hudson System. So we have documented by we, the larger we, Dr. Ellen Marsden and other researchers have documented that the greatest number of harmful invasive species, and of the 51 non-native species in Lake Champlain, about a dozen or so have been documented to cause harm. So are about 12 to 13 of those 51 species are actually invasive. Um, <clears throat> but the majority of those harmful invasives have come through the Champlain Canal. So here is where the round goby has been detected. Um, and we are now looking at early detection monitoring to evaluate how quickly round goby might move towards um, Lake Champlain. There is also a round goby population in the St. Lawrence River and has been found in the lower section of the Richelieu River. In evaluating that um, population, round goby have to move upstream through a number of dams and natural um, rapids to get into Lake Champlain before they would reach the Chambly Canal, which could help them move into Lake Champlain. We are also assessing that and doing early detection monitoring and collaborating with the Quebec Ministry of Environment on, on monitoring that, that population. But currently the biggest threat um, is from the south. Um, the other concern is that the closer that a viable population of round goby gets to Lake Champlain, 
the the greater the likelihood of an intentional or an unintentional introduction of round goby is through bait buckets to Lake Champlain. The difference between on uh, Quebec to the north is that there is they do not allow any live bait. So live bait is illegal in the province of Quebec. In Vermont and New York, live bait is legal, but it has to be certified um, disease-free. And they do have some harvest zones in Lake Champlain in particular. Lake Champlain is documented as having aquatic invasive species present. So if you harvest from Lake Champlain, you can only use the fish that you harvest from Lake Champlain in Lake Champlain, and you cannot transport live fish from Lake Champlain to use as bait in another body of water. So bringing it back to the Champlain Canal Barrier Feasibility Study, um, since 2017, um, we have been working with a project stakeholder team to identify a number of different methods that have been configured into different alternatives that have been evaluated to look at an all taxa approach to preventing the interbasin transfer of invasives between the Hudson and the Champlain drainages. Um, and those, those uh, alternatives, there were six final alternatives that were evaluated. Um, they were, we looked at them for cost benefit analysis and identified a number of diff different criteria. And through, a through that analysis have moved down to three alternatives and the final report will recommend um, one final alternative. Um, the three alternatives that are um, evaluated in uh, a little bit of greater detail in the report is all involved with looking at the height of the Champlain Canal, which is between locks eight and locks nine. So at the height of the Champlain Canal, there's water that comes in from the Hudson River through the Glens Falls feeder. And the Glens Falls feeder brings water to maintain navigability in the system. That Hudson drainage water flow, flows north and downhill into the Champlain drainage and south and downhill into the Hudson drainage. So the idea is to prevent that Hudson water from moving north into the Champlain drainage um, by reversing the flow at lock nine so that um, none of that water goes north into the Champlain drainage, putting in a number of methods like building a berm, putting in a back pump, raising weirs, um, and adding boat lift and cleaning stations, repairing locks, et cetera. So the three alternatives are to build a physical barrier south of lock nine, keeping the Hudson River to the Hudson. If that physical berm is constructed, we can lift watercraft up to about 100 feet in length and um, a certain tonnage that will be determined over that berm they can be cleaned and put in on the other side no matter which way they're traveling but it would not allow for the passage of commercial traffic there hasn't been any commercial traffic in the system for the last few years but some items that have been moved in recent history include um, uh, aggregate or rock from just north of lock nine south to albany and back and forth um, it's the mechanism by which like the new UVM research vessel would arrive to Lake Champlain or possibly maybe the base of a new ferry. Um, there are height restrictions because there are bridges and such throughout the system um, so that the uh, any type of a ferry that's brought in through that system would have to be um, the rest of it would have to be constructed once it gets to Lake Champlain. Um, the other two alternatives <clears throat> of these three final or at lock nine itself, and would include lifting just uh, small watercraft or small and large watercraft over lock nine and allowing for commercial traffic to pass at low risk times or on a limited schedule. So the difference between the large boat lift and the small boat lift is if large boats and small boats are lifted, then the locks would only be open for commercial traffic. If you put in a small boat lift, then um, large watercraft and commercial watercraft would have to move through the lock um, at some scheduled time. Um, in terms of how the Rapid Response Task Force is responding to Round Gobi, um, our Rapid Response Task Force, again, has been evaluating the timing, the threats, and the options of response, um, looking at the movement of Round Gobi from the Hudson and the Richelieu towards Lake Champlain, Considering the long-term Champlain Canal barrier alternatives as the all-taxa approach, this was something that 
Um, currently, if we're wrapping up the first phase of the study, it will require a phase two study. The phase two study, we would also pursue section 542, which requires a 35% match. That study could cost as much as $4 million. Um, it would include the NEPA process, permitting, gathering additional data, and 100% design so that the project would be shovel ready. Um, the Army Corps anticipates that that might take two years or so to get done. Um, and we have not secured the local match, though our Lake Champlain Basin Program Steering Committee has approved that we can move forward with that project in the special Section 542 Assistance Program with the Army Corps of Engineers. So it's important to complete this phase one and move into phase two. Um, we're also looking at evaluating interim solutions. Um, right now, we have a position open uh, with New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Basin Program are co-funding for an outreach specialist. Um, again, that person would be housed within New York State DEC. Um, and they would be working with communities and angling groups along the canal to talk about the threat of interbasin transfer of invasives, as well as the threat of a bait bucket introduction. Um, so all that comes with that is proper identification, disposal of the species, et cetera. Um, in terms of our early detection monitoring program, the Rapid Response Task Force has a Rapid Response Emergency Fund. Um, so we were able to tap those resources to initiate a contract with USGS New York, and we're working with experts from our team um, to identify locations which we will sample uh, between the confluence of the Mohawk and the Hudson River and Lake Champlain and add additional sites north of the border in Quebec so that we're looking for um, uh, the round goby and its range or how quickly it moves towards Lake Champlain using environmental DNA and trawling. And then if any aquatic, any of the actual round gobies are captured, we'll also be testing them to see if they're carrying VHS. So again, phase one of this study for the permanent solution or the all taxa approach um, is concluding and we hope to be able to share that report with you um, in the next week. For phase two, we're ready to move into this phase. It's about a $4 million project. We're working very hard to secure local match. Um, the local match could be Great Lakes Fishery Commission dollars. We're also exploring the use of the Champlain Hudson Power Express project remediation dollars, um, for which a number of years ago, the Champlain Canal and Invasive Species were identified as a priority project. It's just a matter of timing of when those dollars might become available and how competitive um, this project might be within those resources. The final phase of implementation of a selected alternative for an all taxa barrier approach um, would be pursued through, through water, the Water Resources Development Act, Section 5146, which specifically identifies the Champlain Canal and the barrier. Um, this would be a full federal expense, so 100% federal appropriation that would be needed, and the Army Corps is estimating that this would cost about $40 million to um, construct, operate, and maintain. So again, here is the height of the Champlain Canal where Hudson Water, when the canal is open, it is shut right now. It closes between November and May and is dewatered for maintenance and for, um, for, for, for winter, no use. Um, but this water is flowing uh, during the regular season where we're pretty consistently receiving Hudson River water into Champlain currently. So again, in the next steps, um, we're going to be implementing early detection monitoring as soon as ICE is out on the Hudson. We've got a contract. We're working on a quality assurance project plan. Um, we're working to increase outreach with anglers and boaters and the public. We have this New England interstate position posted right now. Um, we've posted it nationally through a number of different um, channels. We're assisting Quebec with monitoring and alternatives for evaluating the threat of the Chambly Canal as a mechanism for invasive species movement in and out of Lake Champlain. And we're heavily pursuing the phase two feasibility study. So that is my update um, for you today. And if you have any questions, I will stop sharing my screen so I can see you. Here we go. Thanks, Meg. Um, any questions for Meg to start with? Did, there's some urgency and some concern. Obviously, there's was calls recently 
from the Nature Conservancy to the New York uh, governor and and others to potentially block the canal and an interim shut down one of the canals just before number nine um, before the season. And I don't know if others have thoughts or comments on on what's happening. Um, Mark, it looks like Carrie has her hand up. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Thank you, and thank you for that uh, important report. Uh, it's devastating, and um, yet one more threat for our poor lake. Uh, we've been talking about trying to close the canal for for some time, and it seems like we continue to run up against uh, the, the high cost of taking action, only to find ourselves once again in a crisis mode in terms of trying to address these these problems. So I, I find I'm a bit frustrated. I'm sure you are as well, um, because we keep kicking this can down the road and trying to identify it as a as a major problem well into the future. And so I, I, I guess a couple of questions. I, I presume the canal is within the New York jurisdiction. Yes, New York okay. State Canal Corporation is another branch of the state agency government, um, and they um, are currently deferring primarily to New York State DEC. Okay. And what what can we do at this point in time? Because I I know that um, it's it's frustrating and. Um, and I think we want we share your frustration and see the urgency of this. this well, I think for from the Lake Champlain Basin Program point of view, we're going to follow process. We're going to do this rapid response. We're evaluating, you know, options. We're following the channels that we can follow. We've known that interbasin transfer has been an issue for many years, and we've been pushing. Um, I think the Round Gobi elevates the need to move forward with an all taxa barrier approach. Um, the interim solutions you know we're looking at and evaluating um, but there are you know uh, you know there are other voices and ideas around what you know what interim steps can be taken um, I think right now we want to make sure that we are moving to the end point of having that all taxa barrier um, in in place in a few years um, regardless of whatever happens in the short term, we hope that Round Gobi don't make it to Lake Champlain and some other action can be taken to prevent it from getting into Lake Champlain. Um, but I think it's it's also important to note that um, it, this, the future of the, sh of the Champlain Canal and the whole New York Canal system, um, I think is to really, really remain open for recreational use and boats can move through the system even with a physical berm in place it's uh they would have to be lifted up and over and cleaned to go in on the other side what the big thing is here is there would be no more commercial use of the system and one of the alternatives that's proposed for building the physical berm also suggests building loading landings on either side north and south most outfitters have to truck whatever they're they're trying to move on a barge to a certain location anyway. Um, so those are those are parts of the alternative. And even if, you know, one of the options that's being, you know, promoted by different groups, including the Nature Conservancy, is to close a lock. But I think that doesn't close the canal system. That there, there still remains open access for people to recreational move mm -hmm move through the other locks of the system or move around those locks in the system. Um, so I think in terms of having a successful approach, we need to diversify the use of the canal system um, and make sure that it's, you know, for mostly support recreational uses, glamping, camping, biking, kayaking, snowshoeing, all of those great things um, bring people to the system, but have a mitigation measure so that, you know, today it's round Gobi, but tomorrow if it's snakehead or Asian carp or hydrilla or quagga mussel, um, we don't have to go through this again. Can I speak to that for a second? Can you folks hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? My, yeah. my, name's, my name's William Cook uh, at the Nature Conservancy. Could I take just a couple minutes to discuss this? Because you're asking what can be done now, which is exactly the right question. We have been basically, the Canal Corp is focused on through transit and history. 
And they have, over many years, <coughs> quite clearly said they don't care about invasive species at all. In fact, they watch them go by. We have DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation. They study, they study invasive species as they swim by. So DEC studies and the fish swim. We've gotten to the point now where we have said enough is enough. The governor last August signed legislation making permanent an aquatic invasive species program in New York. We have said to the governor's office and have been joined by over 1,500 people and a lot of professionals in saying, you have to, you have to close a lock. We want you to lift the boats around it, you know, lift them, clean them, and set them in. But at the end of the day, if you do not close a lock, the, the goby's going to get to Champlain. The only question is, will it be this summer or will it be next summer? But the, the statistical probability is 100%. So we're pushing New York to make a fundamental change in how they look at invasive species. And we're pushing them to go from watching them swim by to stopping them. New York has plenty of money. New York, I, and I know I'm not supposed to say that, but New York is fat with cash. New York could do this without federal money. New York could fix this problem if they choose to. The Canal Corp want, is, is, is not going to be helpful. They're a, a under the control of the New York Power Authority. Can't even get their attention. So we've gotten the governor's attention, we've gotten the administration's attention, and our push is they need to make a decision in the next two weeks. Here's why. Whatever they do, they have to notify the boaters. We're proposing that they close one lock temporarily until the permanent solution's in place. We're proposing that they notify the boaters, that boaters have the opportunity to notify Canal Corp that they want want to do through transit, they would get permission and notify them when. This is all doable. The boat lifts, all doable. The barge, all of this is current technology available in New York. New York probably already owns it. But our problem is, we're. this is all politics. Forget the science, folks. This is all politics. The reason I asked for the opportunity to, to spend some time with you folks this evening is to suggest and urge that in your personal capacity, you, you contact the New York State governor or your elected officials in Vermont. By the way, we Vermont TNC is talking to them, and we're trying to get them to engage uh, the, the, the governor in New York. But we are being told that New York will make a decision in the next 14 days. And that decision is, is going to be the end of the road, one way or the other. I'm also being told by our people that the first species that will be primarily just devastated will be the trout. That, in fact, what you said about the bass is accurate. You'll get bigger bass, but you'll have no juveniles. So for a period of time after they go after the trout, the round goby will spend probably about 10 years displacing the bass. In that time, there'll be some bigger bass. But but there won't be any juveniles, no small ones. This is going to be a bigger disaster for Lake Champlain than I think anybody understands. And the fact that it's preventable by simply closing one lock is astounding to us that we have to go through this exercise and, and push the state of New York to do the right thing. But absent more public pressure, I'm, I'm, to, I'm more than concerned. And we have an opportunity. The other issue, folks, is long term. If New York can't do it for the Gobi, what are they going to do for Asian carp? If they won't do it now, when will they? And the answer is probably never. So we've looked at this as the moment when we think that, and to be honest with you folks, the fact that it's an election year is not lost on us. This is the best shot we have, probably for a very long time, to get the state of New York to actually do what it agreed to do with the state of Vermont. I mean, the state of New York has agreed with the state of Vermont and Fish and Wildlife to take actions to stop invasive species from getting into Lake Champlain. So they signed an agreement saying, yes, we will do it. Now we're at the point where they have to do it. 
and they're not. And the guy who runs Canal Corp is doing everything he possibly can to make sure that nothing gets changed. And we're, we're, um, we are at a point where we think that everybody who has a dog in the fight needs to make their voice heard in the next week or 10 days if we're going to change the outcome. That's why I wanted some time with you. I, I appreciate it. If you have questions, I, I, I'm happy to answer them, but I wanted to make sure that you folks had the, the perspective of the Nature Conservancy in New York. We appreciate the Nature Conservancy in Vermont and their activities on this as well. Lori, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I want to speak to this as a CAC member, but also uh, in my role as director of the Lake Champlain Committee. As many of the CAC members know, we're a bi-state organization, and one of our focal areas is aquatic invasive species. Uh, you know, what both William and Meg have said, and thank you very much for your thorough presentations and the information that you're providing, uh, this is not the first request for action on the canal. And in 2012, there was a major joint effort to uh, close the canal temporarily to prevent spiny water flea. That's just one example of the invasive species that have moved north of the, of the invasives whose source that we know of, the, the vector for most of them is the southern canal. And you know, as, as William said, we have an opportunity to change course and we're not asking for something that is going to have a significant recreational impact. When you think of how we use waterways and trail systems recreationally, you know, uh, there are many times, you know, we have, we have uh, inland waterway systems where people are canoeing and portaging. And so you can look at this short-term movement um, away from the canal as a simple portage to help prevent invasive species from marching further north. And as representatives of the CAC, one of the things that we can do is we can decide tonight that we were, we're going to request Governor Scott to contact Governor Hochul and to ask that she take action to keep that lock closed. Uh, and and I think you know reinforcing that request is our memorandum of understanding uh, between New York and Vermont and Quebec, which urges that uh, there's a collaborative, cooperative approach on issues of mutual concern and the strategic plan for fisheries, which was uh, updated in 2020, that has a focus on aquatic invasive species. As both Meg and William have said, there can be devastating impacts on our natural resources, on the fishery system within Lake Champlain if we don't act now, and there's no reason not to act. And I think very importantly, action on keeping this lock closed will spur and accelerate the much delayed action for a permanent solution for the Champlain Canal, which we desperately need. You know, we have nearly twice as many um, invasives in the Hudson River and nearly four times as many in the Great Lakes. Those are all, they are moving towards us placing great threat on our waterways. We have plenty of examples in other waterways of the devastating impacts. We don't have to have that commercial on Lake Champlain and we shouldn't allow this species in. And so it's really, really important to take this action for the very reasons William and, and has noted and certainly we very much appreciate the background. So I, I wanna give um, opportunity for other people to ask questions, but I do wanna make a motion of action here for us tonight uh, to move forward on this because the clock is ticking very loudly. Thank I, I you. also wanted to add one thing last season, I, I went up to that the spur, the Champlain uh, Canal spur, and I talked to the guys who actually operate the locks. Last year, they said, because I said to them, how many people went through here last year? How many boats went through this lock last year? A hundred? Oh, no, not, not that many. Maybe 85. Well, that's not, that's up and back. So it looks like 40, 40 boats went through there in a season. 
We're talking about 40 recreational boaters being inconvenienced to some degree. And we're talking about protecting a $350 million a year fishery. And, and, and Canal Corp is committed to helping facilitate the transport of invasive species. That's, that's what they do best. Absent the governor stepping in and saying, do this now, well, you should have no expectation of any good news. Thank you. Carol? Thank you. I, I'm wondering, um, Mr. Cook, if you have some language, like a nice letter that you could give us that would in, especially include this thing about how many boats are actually going back and forth and a specific request so that we can put that together for the governor. The governor, I, I would think the governor's staff, it'd be hard for them to figure out all the stuff that you, that you know, and maybe Lori could get together with you and then we could send a draft letter for the, our governor to send. And then would you also think that we should send something from the Speaker of the House and something for the President Pro Tem of the Senate? And I mean, what, what else besides that? Uh, first, I would be happy to put together a letter, uh, a base letter for you folks. We probably have something pretty close now. I'd be happy to do that tomorrow with uh, with one of your people. So if you just have one of your folks reach out to me, uh, I'll, I'll make that happen. DEC knows all about this. The Nature Conservancy has been into DEC. I mean, frankly, we're in there so often we should have our own desk. We have we have made sure that DEC understands the issue intimately and how okay. to fix it. Okay, also. so and does is does DEC have a draft letter ready or what? Uh, DEC, I'm I'm going to wisely not characterize DEC's position or anything they're doing because I uh, that just is not going to come. That's not going to be good. Let's just say DEC is not doing what they should be doing. That's the it, best I can do. Okay. Bill, so, are you talking about Vermont DEC or New York no, DEC? No, New, New York DEC. All right. Okay. New York DEC. And it's New York DEC that's supposed to be doing this. All right. Well, New maybe we, DEC we ought to. DEC studies them yeah. as they swim by. Canal uh, okay. opens the locks, <laughs> DEC studies them, and they swim by. What our long term folks, if we can actually get the state of New York to do the right thing, if we can get the state of New York to do the right thing, our long term is to start to get out toward the Rome area on the Erie and start fixing this long term. Okay, but so if we besides, can't get them to stop the Gobi. We right. got no chance out on the Erie and stopping the rest of the mess. All right. So I mean, I don't know. I don't know whether the rest of the committee feels the way I do, but if if you can, if, if, and if the committee feels the same way I do, which is we need the information so we can communicate this from our governor. And then, have you spoken to the Quebec people? Uh, I haven't personally. I know the Nature Conservancy is talking to them, and I know Nature Conservancy in Vermont is working this issue with your electeds. Um, but because the time is so short, okay. uh, we're limiting our focus. Well, hopefully you'll give the same draft letter to the Quebec um, folks, and then we can all send a similar request. That would be what I would think we could do, but that's just me. Lori, I'm going to let you go, but I just have a quick observation for timing wise. We have a quorum, so we could uh, move forward with your motion to take action. Um, I think it'd have to be contingent on perhaps you. I think you could probably turn that around faster, but some language that's a resolution for us to take action on. We can do that via proxy. Um, we have sufficient membership if there's unanimous consent tonight to move forward with it. Um, I, I presume contingent on the members uh, having a having a look at the language of, of a resolution that we might move forward. Uh, the second thought is whether or not there's opportunity for our legislators to bring up and come up with a similar resolution that is both that way we both have the CAC taking action and the legislature trying to take action to press the governor and of course our DEC to move forward in supporting um, the advocacy around a, a halt on utilization of it. I have a, other questions and comments, but I wanted to be sure that we at least had the opportunity to consider uh, 
taking action tonight before we lose time and or need to move on to other items. Does that sound reasonable, Lori? Yeah, it sounds good to me. I just want to note that the advocacy community in Vermont is is focused on this and uh, is putting together their own outreach to uh, the governor's office and um, the environmental agency. So that's in the works uh, with LCC, the Nature Conservancy, VNRC, and, and others. Uh, I think there's also an opportunity for us, I don't know when the next meetings are, uh, but to follow through with the New York CAC and the Quebec CAC to have a joint uh, recommendation of action on this as the CACs, uh, you know, that's something is, is right. a little lower priority if it's going to be slow. Um. Um, I, yeah, I think uh, New York, Katie, New York's meeting is coming up in two weeks. Yep, on the 28th. On the 28th, um, and we could check in with Pierre I'm I'm going to uh, be having a conversation with Pierre tomorrow anyway, so I could follow up and see uh, where he is on the issue. But um, for time, do you would you like to articulate a rough motion that that we can follow through with better language that we could take some action on now and and uh, at least get a sense of whether this quorum um, is interested in moving forward with a, a further resolution? Because we can, we can clean up on the rest of the language by proxy approval and then deliver it. Sure, I think we should just keep it simple and that we are going to urge the governor to contact Governor Hochul and request that on an interim basis, while a long-term solution is developed, the current physical barrier between the river uh, and the lake water be maintained. And we can provide details on that further in terms of uh, the the reasoning for that. And I'm happy to help uh, with that as well. OK, Katie, did you get most of that? Uh, yes, and I can refer back to the recording to make sure I have it okay. all. <laughs> um, is there a second? I'll second it. Carrie seconded. it. Um, is there further discussion? Uh, I do have one question. Sure. I think we we ought to also engage our congressional delegation on this matter. You know, I know that um, there may be some opportunity to secure some federal funding. I know it's always difficult to match federal with federal, but um, but I raised that issue to see to the extent to which we can raise their awareness, get them engaged, and, and potentially uh, offer some. Um, additional assistance. Just want to note that they are have been briefed, are engaged. I don't know if some of you saw the Vermont Digger article from um, not last Friday, but the Friday before. Right. Right. Um, and I know uh, certainly uh, several of us in the environmental community met with them as recently again as of last Tuesday. The Nature Conservancy has briefed them, as has our organization. Uh, and there's uh, uh, work underfoot for a joint, and Will, you may, you may know more about this than I, but a joint statement from New York and Vermont congressional uh, uh, members on this issue. Uh, folks, I just sent a letter over to KDARR at LCBP.org, and that's the letter that the Enviros used uh, last week. And that should have everything in it you guys need. If you need anything else, let me know. But I wanted to turn that around pretty quick. If that works for you. Thank you, Bill. Um, any other comments on the pending motion? Carol? Well, I had suggested also to the president pro tem and the, and the speaker of the house. Is there any problem with that, do you think? Because they, the motion didn't include them. No, I mean, we're... We are at the the uh, whims of the governor, and part of our um, part of our charge is to deliver our report to the legislature. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't.
deliver this to the highest levels of the legislature on an urgent matter. So I, I think that makes sense. Great. I accept that friendly amendment, Carol. Sorry. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> so amended. <laughs> Any more comments, questions, concerns with the resolution, Bob? You're muted, Bob. Still muted, Bob. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> does uh, Vermont DEC have a position on this at all? But I mean, I totally defer to Representative Dolan. This isn't, I don't know as much about this top and, and Mark and, and Lori, you all, it appears to be very, so I'll just follow your lead, but it just seems very fast paced compared to normally. And I applaud that, um, but you know, I'd like to see all of the data too. Just to quickly respond to that, uh, my understanding, we haven't heard that much from DEC on this. The Fish and Wildlife Department uh, is very concerned about this in Vermont and has been asking for action. My understanding is, and, and this may be a little bit dated information, the last I heard about this for a week and a half is they haven't uh, necessarily gotten a response. Well, excellent. Thank you. I mean, we we're, we're aware based on our action plan that the DEC has slowly starved <laughs> the uh, invasive species program. And, uh, you, you know, part of our action plan was to press for additional funding to get it back up to where it was even uh, three or four years ago. So. Um, that's an ongoing concern for the for the committee um, regarding DEC's prioritization of invasive species. But I presume with the urgency in the activity that they're taking notice and hopefully taking action. Um, any other comments before or questions, concerns before we go to a vote on this? I recognize that uh, it wasn't a specific agenda item, but I, I do think that it's an opportunity for us to take action and continue to um, gather more data, but there is uh, an urgent concern. So all those in favor of the motion as amended? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Seeing none, that is the unanimous consent of the quorum. We'll work on the language and try to distribute that uh, as soon as tomorrow. We'll take a look at the letter that uh, Bill Cook has sent around to Katie and we'll, um, we'll move along with it uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, Lori, Bill, Meg, thanks for your uh, conversation, discussion, presentations, and uh, motions. We've uh, uh, moved beyond our agenda um, by about 20 minutes, but I know Eric and staff were prepared to present on the opportunities for action. So, Eric, if you're still available, we can move along with that. And um, thank uh, you, folks. Appreciate we'll it. Yeah, good evening. Thanks again, Bill. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, and just on that, oh, Bill was a little too quick to leave, but um, on that uh, last topic, just real quickly. So just so you all are aware, um, as you know, Meg, uh, the Basin Program is not able to uh, lobby or advocate uh, elected officials. However, we do work hard to make sure that they are informed and engaged on on important topics and and. Meg and, and uh, Jim Brangan and I were down in, in Washington, D.C. last week doing that with our congressional staff from our congressional delegation. And each of those meetings, we spent um, no less than a half an hour, if not more, in some cases, talking about the Round Gubby issue, um, both Vermont and New York members. And they're all, uh, I think, very well read into this issue, actually, now, thanks to all the collective work that's happening. 
and um, and concerned. Uh, in fact, we just met with Senator Gilbert staff on Friday afternoon, and uh, they had just gotten off a call with the governor of New York's staff from the governor of New York's office um, about it, and they are they were very concerned about this. Um, so they are they are working on putting together a position statement. I believe that all six members, both all four senators and Congressman Welch from Vermont and Congresswoman Stefanik are, are going to sign on to. So there is there is definitely uh, this definitely is on their radar. Um, also, I'll just wrap up and say that or uh, yeah, say that uh, the Lake Champlain Steering Committee will be uh, learning more about about the this this uh, topic as well in their April twelfth meeting, um, which these are public meetings. We're happy to to invite you all. To, to listen in on those, those conversations as well. The, I've asked New York DEC and the Quebec Ministry of Environment to uh, review their positions on uh, Round Gobi through the Champlain Canal for New York DEC and, and the Chambly Canal to the north and the Richelieu for Quebec Ministry of Environment. Um, actually, it's not the Ministry of Environment, it's ministry, basically their fisheries ministry. Um, uh, that works on invasive species. Uh, so we'll uh, learn more from them at that forum as well. Um, all right, so uh, uh, opportunities for action. We can give you the abbreviated version here. Um, so I th think you all are familiar with what opportunities for action is. Um, just the, 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 the short version is that it, it, it is our comprehensive plan uh, for the Lake Champlain Basin. It is more than just phosphorus and cyanobacteria and invasive species. It includes or addresses uh, other issues like monitoring and contaminants, um, fisheries issues, and also uh, 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 technical um, uh, uh, working with communities on technical assistance and education and outreach programming as well. Um, this new draft plan includes feedback from the June 2021 summit that I think many of you actually participated in in, in one format or another. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I think what you all are aware, it's organized by our four goals, which uh, are clean water, healthy ecosystems, thriving communities, and an informed and involved public. Um, Within each goal, it's then organized by uh, uh, objectives and then strategies and then finally tasks. Um, and then the staff are on today to uh, review these these updates with you. So we're going to just touch on the highlights of what's new basically for you all or in the plan. Um, and just know that the, the new plan also will include response metrics. And we are working on developing a, a five year implement approach to help prioritize strategies and tasks um, over each of the next five fiscal years as, as well. So I think that I will stop there and turn it over to, uh oh, you all just disappeared on me. There you are. Uh, turn it over to, is Matt on? <clears throat> he is. I see his I'm here. logo there. There he is. Hi, Matt. Welcome back. Hope you had a good day skiing in the powder. And uh, Matt's going to review the clean water section with you. Take it away, Matt. All right, thanks, Eric, and nice to see you all. Um, lots of familiar faces. Let me see if I can share my screen here. I'm, I don't have my normal setup because I'm hiding from my toddlers right now. So let's hey. see. Did someone say something? Yeah, no? Matt, if you'd oh, like, yeah. I, could, I could drive and uh, you could get back to your toddlers uh, once you're done with your presentation. Okay, great. Yeah, let's see if, can you see the screen now? Yes. All right, so I will um, end the screen share when, when I'm all set with clean water. Thanks. Okay, very good. All right, um, so yes, ho hopefully all of you are familiar with opportunities for action and have, uh, are at least familiar with um, the clean water goal. Um, we really, uh, in revamping the clean water goal, we really just expanded upon it. So we there's almost nothing that was taken out of the 2017 version. Uh, we took a lot of the good ideas from the June summit last year that many of you participated in and added them to the clean water goal. So you'll see those additions in red and then every all the text that's in black is um, essentially what was in the 2017 version. So the red text is, are the new additions. Trying to make this a bit bigger here. Uh, and beyond that, we did a bit of reorganization as well um, to try to make it clear to people who will be using this document, including um, 
uh, basin program staff where you kind of split it up into um, the first objective, which is uh, focused on research and understanding our water quality issues. Um, and then later or the next objectives on the list will be more on the implementation side. So actually doing things um, based on the research to try to improve water quality. So the first one here, the first objective under the clean water goal is to improve our understanding of water quality conditions, trends and trends uh, and determine the effectiveness of past management to inform future management decisions. And I'm not going to read through all this. Um, I'm, I'm sure if it's not available to you all, we can make it available, <clears throat> but I'll just highlight a few as I go through. So um, we, uh, for an example, of course, we're going to continue the, the Lake Champlain long-term monitoring program. And in addition to that, uh, we now have um, the opportunity to expand it and to include an in-situ monitoring network um, to measure water quality conditions at a high frequency and in real time to make those available, the data available to our stakeholders. Um, there's a new task in here to improve our understanding of cyanobacteria in Lake Champlain through expanding existing monitoring programs, increasing our cyanotoxin testing, and using new technologies that might be available. Um, there is a task here that stemmed from uh, CAC initiatives to support research to reduce agrochemical application and runoff. Um, and then similarly to um, improve our understanding of road de-icing salt impacts and effective management strategies. So that's just a few to highlight there uh, in the research objective. The next objective here is to reduce, and this is really an action objective, so reduce contaminants of concern and pathogens. Um, so this is, we expanded this one quite a bit. So uh, the first one here is to fund and promote programs that reduce public beach closures. And the next one again is stem from, um, from the summit, but also CAC initiative to fund and promote programs that increase the uh, efficiency of use of agrochemicals and limit their transport to waterways. Um, there's some more on PFAS, microplastics, and other contaminants of current concern through this objective. The next one is really all about uh, reducing nutrient loading, which of course is a big part of what we're focused on. Um, and this is broken up, the strategies are broken up by sources of nutrients on the landscape. So um, our stream bank sediments, agricultural sources, developed lands, forested lands. And there's uh, a strategy, we're still kind of in the process of how to format this, but to uh, implement uh, recommendations from the Missisquoi Bay Binational Phosphorus Reduction Task Force, um, which is really just kind of getting underway. So. Um, we don't have those recommendations quite yet, um, but that will be a focus of this uh, this this round as well. And then we have a new objective here. This is the last one listed, and that's to this. This includes um, both research and implementation component components. Um, so the first is to research um, to under is to support research to understand the impact of climate change on clean water and act to adapt uh, to climate change impacts. So the first section here is all about understanding the impacts of climate change here in our region. And then the next strategy is to uh, use what we've learned and adapt through uh, um, um, a variety of different uh, methods, such as um, adapting to increasing water temperatures, adapting to reduce uh, or to um, changes on water availability and use, for example. And that is the end of the clean water section. So I know we're short on time. Uh, I can take any questions if there are any, and if not, we can move on to healthy ecosystems, I think. Good, you're still there. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Karina. Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering in the the monitoring task area, could does that is that monitoring limited to Lake Champlain itself, or does it include the tributaries, or could it include the tributaries? Um, yeah, so I think as well, 
just to be clear, we do we do the long term monitoring program does uh, monitor on on 22 of the lake's major tributaries. So we already we've been monitoring tributaries since um, 1990, which is which is great. And we do also fund research on you know question based research on tributaries around the basin as as needed to support or to inform management. Um, and as as written, this would certainly um, support monitoring on tributaries in order to, to support or to inform management decisions. So yes, I think Perfect. is the answer. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hey, it's great to hear, see you and thank you for this. Good to see you too. It's been a while. Yes, it has. <laughs> uh, my question is regards to the your component, your clean water component dealing with uh, adaptation to the impacts of climate change. And this is something we're kind of grappling with right now, and it, and it may be just simply a function of lack of information on our part to fully understand the concept behind payments for ecosystem services. But one of the things that we struggle with in the in the legislature, we we want to support our farms and support healthy soils. Our concern is whether there's a trade-off. Where if we're so if we're narrowly defining what we mean by ecosystem services that would qualify for payments, does that set us up potentially for <laughs> unintended consequences such as a degradation of water quality? And uh, so I, I raise this because it would be terrific to get and, and perhaps you're already engaged in this question, but to to get kind of um, more information and about this approach to ensure that um, when there's a public policy question in front of us, that we're not going to be, uh, you know, we're going to be supporting something with a full breadth and suite of knowledge and information concerning uh, ecosystem services and soil health. What I'm thinking of is in particular, to the extent to which we're increasing the use of uh, herbicides application on um, on cover crops, for example, that would be one one question. And and I I know there's no such thing as free lunch, <laughs> but but I also know that when we're talking about using taxpayer dollars to pay for services, we just need to make sure that we are um, quite aware of of implications or impacts to those decisions. And I really look to uh, your your um, you know, Lake Champlain Basin Program to help us better understand this opportunity in front of us. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that um, comment. And yeah, the, um, the Basin Program is engaged in the Payment for Ecosystem Services um, development process. I'm a member of the um, the work group that the Agency of Ag is is uh, running. I'm I'm a member, you know, of course, representing the Basin Program, but through the Vermont Agricultural uh, Water Quality Partnership. Um, that's kind of my my route to that that uh, seat on that committee or the work group. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of work there. It's it really is under development. Um, I'm I'm not sure, you know, that it doesn't. It's not called out specifically in opportunities for action. Um, and it's of course related to climate change, but it's not a specific task to you know provide payments for ecosystem services necessarily. So that is something you know we'll continue to support um, the state of Vermont's efforts and provide information as, as we can. Um, so I don't know if that if there's a more a specific question I can answer, Carrie, or if that information is just good enough background for you. Well, to be clear, I thank you for that. And to be clear, I think um, I, for one, am very much in support of uh, agriculture, our agricultural future, how we can support soil health, the opportunities for improved carbon storage in our soils. All that is is um, critically important. What I'm raising questions about is to the extent to which there are trade-offs and what are those trade-offs? And I just don't have that information, and to the extent to which you you are able to help um, identify or provide discussions on this topic, it, I think it's only going to help assuage some some um, 
consternation that um, that is out there pertaining to the use of, of taxpayer dollars for as an incentive for this sort of work. I would certainly support incentives uh, to achieve deliberate outcomes, but um, but careful at how what the what the trade offs could be. Understood. Yeah, thanks for that comment. And um, I will, as I said, I'm a member of that work group, so I can bring that to to them and keep it in mind as we as we continue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Matt, I think I'll switch over to healthy ecosystems. OK, thumbs up. I'm going to share a like screen here, see if you can see that. Okay, I'm not hearing any objections, so I'm hoping you're seeing my screen. <laughs> okay. Looks good, Meg. Thank you. Um, so for healthy ecosystems, um, thank you again for those who participated in the summit. Um, there was a lot of great discussion and a lot of the considerations that came forward or new ideas that came forward. Um, about 80% of them already existed in our OFA objectives and strategies and tasks, but there were definitely certain places where we were able to provide more clarification. Um, but coming off of the clean water section, um, one important new objective that uh, seemed to warrant um, its own place included climate change um, related to healthy ecosystems, particularly looking at the impacts of climate change on the frequency of floods and lake levels, water temperatures, other impacts to the lake ecosystem. Um, also looking at invasive species with the change of climate and those types of impacts to the economy um, and the environment. Looking at certain types of um, sites of refuge for organisms of concern, uh, considering changing climate and impact, uh, looking particularly at the impacts of climate on lake trout. Um, additionally, there's here's your healthy soils again, <clears throat> Carrie. There was particular concern about looking at protection and restoration of healthy soils for ecosystem function, um, such as carbon sequestration, improved water quality and filtration, flooding impacts, et cetera. So this is a new objective um, for the healthy ecosystems section of opportunities for action. A second new objective, um, summarizing a lot of questions about and uh, recommendations about evaluating ecosystem management programs and policies. So um, making sure that uh, research aligns with policy and ecosystem management goals and funding research to evaluate existing ex ecosystem management programs. Um, so that that includes quite a number of, of programs and and uh, policies. Uh, so they got their their own new objective here as well. Um, going back to the previous objectives in OFA, um, there's three more that focus one on habitat, another one on species diversity, and the third on preventing invasive species. So for conservation of habitat and ecosystem function, um, this is looking at prioritizing, protecting, and restoring different types of habitats. So riparian corridors and floodplains, shorelands, wetlands, um, looking at rare, uh, rare threatened endangered species, and also looking at headwater connectivity. Um, so that was a new one recommended by that group. <clears throat> the next section is looking at preserving and enhancing aquatic and riparian biological diversity. So here we have conducting research. Um, so looking at food web dynamics, um, the interaction of food web and on certain drivers and changes, looking at uh, gaps and assessing, assessing restoration needs for species of greatest conservation need. Um, the the committees felt it was important um, to name lake trout and lake sturgeon as examples, um, promoting fish community research, including juvenile lake trout, brook trout, and landlocked Atlantic salmon, and management of sea lamprey to enhance the fishery. And the last one here is to look at projects that reduce fragmentation created by infrastructure, um, such as roads, dams, culverts for native species, such as brook trout, Atlantic salmon, mud puppies, and salamanders. Can't name them all, but those were the few um, that were identified to be included. Um, and then the last objective is to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. 
Um, many of you are aware that the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act passed in sort of the 11th hour of December in 2018, and congressional um, support led to the creation of the Great Lakes and the Lake Champlain Invasive Species Program, which is authorized at 50 million um, a year. Nothing has been appropriated to date, but we wanted to make sure that that, that program is acknowledged here um, because it identifies gaps and uh, projects and programs that we might initiate should funding come through. Um, supporting our AIS rapid response management plan to respond to new infestations, maintaining involvement in regional and national programs. Um, many of you probably know that we are a member of the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force with an interstate approved Aquatic Nuisance Species Management Plan um, that's co-chaired by NOAA and Department of the Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That gives us great access to national experts um, working on invasive species across the country. Um, we are going to uh, continue to work with our partners along pathways of concern. So these are where the canals come in, overland transport on boats, trailers, illegal stocking, um, and this will be borne out through um, doing our boat launch steward, watercraft inspection and decontamination programs, as well as looking at funding and evaluating um, barriers for the Champlain and Chambly Canal. Supporting management um, and research in the basin, we have a very robust water test and management plan, sea lamprey control program, um, evaluating different management techniques, um, remaining connected to new and innovative research, <clears throat> Um, including looking at sea lamprey alternative controls. And here we have um, finally sort of the outreach with partners. Um, we want to make sure we're using multilingual um, programming so that we're addressing all of the communities and the watershed um, to f fund and support um, education and outreach along different pathways. That's a pretty quick summary of healthy ecosystems if there are questions. Hearing none, are you on next, thanks. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Meg. Jim, you ready? Are you ready to go with thriving communities? Just need you to unmute yourself. Okay, and thank if, you. If uh, uh -huh. Jim, if you can, can you uh, enlarge or zoom in on the Word document a, a, a smidge? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, as Matt said, that we uh, were more expanding opportunities for action, um, taking the information we got from the uh, the summit last June and incorporating those comments and, and coming up with some uh, good strategies and and tasks to address some of those new issues. So um, you'll see in our first objective here is engage and support community management and partners. Um, the first thing we're going to to continue to do is support uh, local watershed groups, and that's through our grants program, our technical assistance, and um, focused on uh, capacity building for our watershed uh, partners. Um, the next issue is to facilitate and coordinate public uh, messaging with management partners. And um, instead of an annual meeting, we'll be developing an annual report of the Lake Champlain Basin Program's activities. Um, and focusing more on coordinating meetings rather than facilitating them. Um, another addition that's been added in uh, is the public feedback. Uh, one of the things the steering committee found is we need to get uh, more information from our uh, community members and, and resource managers to see if, if we're addressing um, the right topics and uh, we have the answers to their questions. Um, the third uh, strategy here is to enhance flood resilience and climate change adaptation in community planning and development. You'll see there's a new task, which is the plan for climate migration. Um, as you all know, that the uh, the population distribution is going to change over the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and we need to be ready for more people in the Champlain Basin. Um, and we'll also continue to serve as a conduit for information, uh, continue to build that professional capacity 
and to uh, foster, foster strong working relationships among the partners of the Basin Program, the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership, and the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Network. We added that in uh, because a lot of the staff work, thanks to Katie Dar, is being done through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. You'll remember that I uh, give pre presentation on what Cabin's been able to do um, two or three meetings ago. Uh, so you see we've added those in. Um, we've also added in uh, technical outreach training, technical issue training, and echo benefit education. This is just a way for uh, us to uh, to help our partners be able to provide uh, a stronger message when they're they're out um, working with the communities um, and also have a better grasp of the technical issues that are, are facing Lake Champlain. And also, you know, the, the idea of having uh, our communities have a better understanding of, of what is the benefit of doing all this work. Um, and of course, the economic analysis stays in there. Um, and then uh, another addition um, requested by the steering committee and the uh, the summit was to focus more on underserved communities and to to build diversity, equity, and inclusion principles into our programming. So you see that through the two tasks is focusing on diversity planning. We're actually getting started on that um, this week um, with uh, with a consultant uh, at the Basin Program and uh, also through encouraging diversity through our grants program. We will really want to focus on underserved communities. OK, our next objective is to focus on uh, water wise economic development. Um, nothing's really changed here with our first strategies. We're, we're hoping to support business innovations to uh, to improve water quality do that through outreach and innovation development. Um, we'll be working to uh, support uh, working landscapes that, that help better protect water quality, more outreach, mostly to, to agriculture, farmers and foresters, the boots on the ground kind of folks, um, and, and continue our awards program um, and focus on those the good work that our, our farming and forester partners are doing. Um, we're going to continue to support green water infrastructure and uh, have a uh, an awards program that that um, links into that work um, and then coordinate efforts among partners to promote the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership, the biosphere um, uh, to, to promote this place as a world class destination. Um, one of the nice things about being uh, active in the biosphere community is there are uh, many well healed visitors that are interested in learning about the place who, who will come here and spend money. Um, so there's a, there's an opportunity there to uh, to focus more on sustainable tourism. Um, speaking of sustainable, uh, we're, we're will also foster a sustainable relationship between the people and the natural resources of the biosphere and the CVNHP. We do that through energy efficiency. The Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership has a collections grant um, that has funded energy efficiency pro projects in the past. Uh, we'll continue to promote sustainability and also continue to to do the coordination efforts for cabin. Um, the, the next, uh, excuse me, the next objective is to support awareness and conservation of our cultural heritage resources. Um, and uh, this this one here, uh, 3C1 is the bread and butter of the Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership. We build on existing knowledge, make new discoveries of the history, culture, and special resources of the CVNHP and make this information accessible to all. So our, our entire grants program really focuses in, in on that to uh, to research and interpret our history and share that history. Um, and so uh, we'll continue with cultural resources support. We'll, we'll continue to maintain that cultural database um, that's online. Um, and one of the things that's that's been uh, added in is to promote ethnographies. Um, unfortunately, during the quadricentennial, we found um, that a big portions of the well most of the Franco-American culture in the uh, in the Champlain Valley has largely disappeared over the last 50 years and there are new American communities in the region uh, we want to be able to have them share their their culture and history with us and and document that that um, culture and history uh, the next strategy is to support the conservation of historical archaeological and natural and cultural resources the CVNHP um, 
one of the things we do well is build the bridges between history and ecology. You might remember we focused on the International Year of Salmon a few years back. Um, next year, we're focusing on the Champlain Canal. That will be interesting. Um, but the idea there is we give people a history lesson that helps them become better stewards today. Um, and so we'll be promoting uh, resource protection and supporting the underwater preserve system. Uh, the next objective is to support lake and basin recreation. This is a real opportunity here, folks, to, uh, to, to, to tie in with the underserved communities of the region. Um, so we'll promote sustainable and accessible recreation opportunities for everyone within the CVNHP with a focus on access for underserved communities. Um, and the ENO group right now is doing fantastic work um, with, with new Americans working with partners to teach them fishing and other uh, other skills outdoors. So we want to promote better access uh, for those folks and um, and have a have a program that emphasizes recreational ethics and, uh, and public safety, sustainable use and stewardship. Um, and so that's that's it for thriving communities. I, I hope that wasn't too much of a fire hose. Um, does anyone have any questions? I guess it was a bit of a fire hose, huh, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> it was even for, for for me, and I've heard the fire hose version quite a bit already. But uh, you know, the, the, I think the the committee members have the 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 not the hard copy, obviously, but the digital copy of the of the the current draft of the plan. And and you know, feel free to provide comments too. Carrie, I just saw you turn on your camera. Hello. Oh, no, no question. I just was okay. turning on my camera after the presentation to show my face. <laughs> right. Well, good to see you, Carrie. Um, all right. If there are not any other questions on thriving communities, then I'll turn it over to Colleen to wrap it up. And and just to save you a little bit of time, I dropped um, the some comments about uh, my, my basically what we're going to be my closing comments on this into the chat. So you can you can see that there the next steps for the plan um, from this point forward. Colleen. Great. Jim, do you want to drive through I&I? I? I'll be happy to. Absolutely. See, he can drive me crazy. He could drive us quickly through it. So <laughs> thanks, Jim. <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> there we go, Colleen. Yes, thank you. So the informed and evolved um, chapter of opportunities for action has not changed a lot but has been influenced to some extent uh, by the June meetings as well as uh, public feedback we have received to date. Uh, we have three primary objectives. One is enhance formal learning of education at all levels and uh, this really addresses not only the K-12 to student programming uh, but our online tools in digital uh, work that we've been doing. Um, if we go down a little bit, Jim, thank you. Uh, we also support professional development opportunities for teachers and educator networks. We work really closely with Sea Grant and Shelburne Farms uh, as part of this process, as well as the Maritime Museum. And we teach uh, uh, teachers cooperatively about the watershed. And part of that process is including cultural heritage components uh, into those networking opportunities. Uh, the other uh, objective in here is to engage youth and watershed management, I should say strategy, sorry. Um, <laughs> but we have been doing that in a couple of ways, mainly through the uh, train the trainer program, but also by working with colleges and within the classes that come into the resource room at ECHO. Uh, we hope to establish more of a mentorship aspect to our programs and again working uh, with Sea Grant that already has a pretty good mentorship going. We're seeing this year, for example, that some of their students who have become Watershed Alliance uh, sort of interns over the past year, year and a half, have now turned to us to become boat launch stewards and that's something that we would like to pursue in the future as we move forward to um, traditionally underserved communities were certainly identified in June and have been incorporated into this chapter as well. Uh, Katie has spoken with you about the Youth Advisory Committee. This is a new component for I&I. &I. Uh, we have had youth involved in our 
uh, grant decision making for the last five years and it's been very fruitful. But between the work that Jim is doing with Cabin and the work that Katie's doing on the Youth Advisory Committee, there's definitely room for uh, strengthening uh, the role of the next generation in informing and involving the public. Um, we've got youth engagement and we're hoping to create some exchange opportunities. This again came in um, through the June summit and we will be developing this a little more in detail as we go along. We also hit some summer youth programs in part through the great work that our partners do in their local grants during the summer months, but uh, we have been strengthening our uh, high school education program with the work that Steph Larkin has been doing um, with both SUNY and uh, UVM uh, to getting high school youth involved, and you'll see that pick up again this summer. The second objective is to build awareness of the basin through informal learning across all communities. And if you think about it, uh, there are pocket target audiences that we have all worked with over time. Uh, marinas are one of the target audiences for the basin program, working with groups like the Lake Champlain Committee and Sea Grant again. And we're about to hold our annual meeting um, on April 1st this year. We've been meeting with the marinas for about uh, 10 or 12 years now, bringing in key components that can help inform them of new uh, lake issues. So uh, the first strategy is communicating watershed science and stewardship information uh, for the public and really uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, not only natural and cultural resources, uh, but including uh, hard science through exhibits and brochures and fact sheets, as well as again, the online work uh, that the CVNHP has been um, really uh, <laughs> heavily hitting the, the uh, electronic version of communicating and has uh, an awful lot of information online. So promoting that in the next few years it, even more heavily will be helpful. Uh, we also expect uh, that we'll be delivering and continuing our face-to-face -face and small group work with members of the public. And one of the metrics we'll be looking at is how many times are we called to do these? So we currently, for example, are working with a Worthen Library and the South Hero Land Trust and two out of their four programs in March are based on the small grant that we have delivered to the local communities. So that's been a cool new partnership, which we hope to continue. And public presentations, yes, and including decision makers, um, we will um, make ourselves available pretty much for anyone who asks. And after sitting behind the desk during COVID, that means anyone who asks can get a yes from the Basin program. Yes, we'd like to uh, present and come talk to you. And I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Um, we have web and electronic outreach. I think Ryan and Elizabeth work on seven or eight of our, uh, our uh, different websites currently. Some of them are fairly small. The Basin program is very extensive. And uh, Matt is really interested in helping to drive some uh, data sharing tools that you'll see popping up to help the public uh, interpret and understand uh, more of the science around the basin. We also do print publications, as you know, uh, and then we're hoping to uh, develop more targeted outreach and engagement strategies for underserved communities. Some of that work, Meg and May, Kate, and have also um, been involved in in the last, uh, really since last fall, last summer and fall. Uh, we'll do some more work on the Missisquoi Bay Phosphorus Reduction Task Force, which has recently um, uh, come back to life in a big way in the last few months. And you'll see the Basin Program doing outreach on that. Uh, climate change and resiliency. This topic was uh, really mentioned across the board in all categories during the June workshop. So uh, we'll be working on promoting some of the education programs and the science uh, behind climate change. And then interpretation through the arts. Uh, we hadn't really anticipated this. It was a really hot item coming in through the CVNHP and we've been able to fund some arts programs for the last three years through the Informed and Evolved section. And then our final uh, objective is facilitate changes in behavior of actions for individuals for their communities. We'll just quickly run through these. Promote individual stewardship action by a variety of means. 
uh, promote community stewardship action. And we were asked to develop a lake leaders program to promote individuals who take steps to improve the health of the lake. So we'll take a look at that. Access or assess, I'm sorry, assess changes in the public's knowledge in behavior. Um, and really, again, focusing on community science to engage and develop the stewardship for the basin. I think, do we have anything left on that next page, Jim? That's it, Colleen. That's it, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? That was a five minute quick summary. Wow. But you know where to find me. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Um, so, yeah, so if anyone does have any comments, um, you know, obviously you can ask now, but uh, if you would like to take some time and review the draft that Katie sent you, um, please feel free to send comments back to Katie. She can coordinate them and, and shuttle them to the, the various staff that would be uh, working on, on them. Um, the draft that Katie sent you is a working draft. You may see uh, edits and, and comments in there. Uh, we're working on polishing that up over the next few weeks, and then we'll be sending it off to the steering committee and um, the EPA for, for review and, and hopefully approval um, in about a month. Lori, did I see your hand pop up? Ah, oh, there you are. Um, yeah, but I, I, um, I, are you done your presentation, Eric? Yes. Gonna, okay. I am. I am done. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for that whirlwind tour and um, all the hard work behind it. Uh, I'm wondering if you, if um, can give us some uh, input on how these initiatives in this revised opportunities for action interfaces with. Uh, the funding, particularly the grants program and capacity building grants, because uh, happily the basin program is seeing a very strong influx of money and new money over a five year period. That's a real opportunity to help invest even more significantly in um, the broader communities in their capacity building. So I'm wondering how that um, interfaces with with opportunities for action and your your future plans. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Lori. Yeah, so um, we are uh, anticipating, not anticipating, we will be receiving um, something close to $8 million per year for the next five years through the infrastructure funds. Those uh, funds are all tied to projects that, um, that uh, address environmental uh concerns so i'm trying to remember the the uh guidance from epa from memory and it's not working um but uh it, it, the, ha the projects have to to address climate change issues and also ideally um work to, towards um uh serving on typically underserved communities as well so there's some there's some somewhat the, the infrastructure funds aren't quite as flexible as uh, as our um, the rest of our section 120 funding is, but projects and programs that we're working on there um, are look are will be uh, a, a dam removal and culvert uh, uh, aquatic organism passage uh, program, um, probably a couple million dollars per year into that work, and then also um, the steering committee is going to consider. Uh, um, some uh, potentially some land acquisition pro grant programs, tree nursery support grant programs, west wetland restoration programs. Um, all these are topics that have not really been vetted yet through our process. So there's a lot of discussion that will happen over the next uh, couple of months or next one month. Um, and then for our base funding, uh, yeah, as you can see, we've, we've really beefed up the, the uh, thriving communities goal quite a bit with technical support to, to watershed groups and, and stakeholders and professionals working in the, in the field also as well. Um, so I'm anticipating we'll be putting some, we'll be increasing our, our support for those, for grant programs that address those topics. Um, and again, tying the, the heritage area in where we can, um, we're also expecting a, a, an increase in the heritage area funding, which should help there as well. Um, what else? Uh, so yeah, we've re we've received a lot of guidance from from um, uh, 
Senator Leahy's office and 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 others that you know they're they're really looking for us to put out as much of this funding and competitive grants as we can. So they'll be uh, uh, trusting a number of different topic areas across the spectrum of OFA. Did that answer? I was kind of rambling there. Did that answer your question? Yeah, somewhat. I and you know, and we can talk about this further, more specifically. But particularly, I'm I'm looking at if you're increasing any of the ceiling limits for grants. I mean, you made a a, a great um, yes. benefit Definitely. when you know you uh, established the small and large E and O grants. So having you know that higher level category, but things like the or, uh, uh, organizational support grants have been. Um, at the four thousand dollar level, it makes it tough for organizations even to apply uh, because you know it, it, the administrative work associated with that isn't necessarily doesn't correspond to that the level of funding. Uh, so I'm wondering yeah, about I mean, that we story. did we increased that a couple of years ago. It was I don't know what two or three thousand dollars a couple of years ago when we when we boosted up to four, and those are those are. Um, intended to be a, a, a lighter lift on on the, the applicant's part um, as well, and particularly for the grant management. A lot of those we try to do as purchase orders, which um, is intended, you know, it doesn't require as much paperwork. But um, you know, you make a good point, and we can also we can take a look at um, at, at demand there. If that program is, um, I wouldn't say it's often. Oversubscribed, we usually are able to to meet uh, or, or yeah to support most of the competitive grants that are submitted through there, um, through that uh, that grant program. But um, yeah, we can take a look at uh, increasing support caps on the, on that program in particular. Thank you, Carrie. I have uh, a brief question. I think it's, and I want to first of all say hi to Colleen too. <laughs> it's great to see you. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> really intrigued, Jim, and you too, Jim. Everyone, <laughs> um, when you talked about um, some of the the interest to support underserved communities, I see a real nexus between education and outreach, our clean water funding, and our, you know, um, our what did you call it? sustainable communities work and where I in, in the manner that where I see the um, one of these intersections is the need for greater education and outreach for communities in underserved areas to be able to access resources. And I, I flag that as uh, I find it um, really um, an opportunity in front of us here to to uh, to try to be as effective as we can in, in directing those dollars for underserved communities, but it may require more of that education and outreach element to your work to be successful. And you, yeah. You've already thought about that, but I just wanted to flag that as a, I think, really intriguing opportunity in front of us. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, I'll let Colleen unmute herself in a, in a second here, but um, we have thought about that. And this this past year, the pandemic has messed with my my schedule and my brain. Uh, at least this past year, if not two years um, now, we've we've actually incorporated um, points like that into our grant programs, and particularly the education and outreach programs. Um, so uh, we have supported um, and given projects. To, uh, that uh, that reach underserved communities uh, more points in the in the in the grant review process, um, and Colleen just is is working through um, our latest round of grants from our small grants. Um, and so that's fresh on her mind, I am sure, Colleen. It's fresh on my mind. Yes, that's right, Eric. So uh, two years ago, we started putting in some extra points for diversity DEI work and. Oh, what we saw is that there were quite a few grant applicants that did respond to that request. So, for example, uh, Lewis Creek Association and Lake Champlain Committee were are doing some work in that area. And and one of I think it was three nodes of that particular grant will be specific to a, a DEI community. Uh, we've also seen an uptake in the last or uptick in the last five years, I would say, for um, work related to indigenous people 
Um, we had a grant come in this year. I had, I think, three grants three years ago. Jim's been doing a lot of work with Indigenous people as well. And our most recent large grant that went to the um, Blue Seed Studio over in Saranac Lake will focus on uh, the Mohawk people. So I think we're aware of it. We're, we're trying to get it addressed at the local level. And uh, Laurie, I'm glad you brought up grants because education outreach funding has gone from roughly 250 to 300,000. And this year, it, it's up a lot. It's 240,000 in small grants and between three and 400,000 in, in large grants. So it's been very competitive and we're seeing uh, good applications coming in to support not only adult populations, but K-12 uh, through the university systems all around the watershed and beyond uh, to help students learn, so. Well, since you mentioned me, Colleen, I'd like to say a couple of things to that. Um, so the CVHP has, I'm sorry to keep you between before dinner here, but CVHP has had the uh, an extra 10 points associated with organizations that are serving underserved communities. Um, and the last time I checked that we had at least 10% of our grants from just the CVHP alone um, go to uh, projects that interpret um, uh, Native American history and culture. So that, that's something that the steering committee should be proud of, that they've, they've been promoting this for years. Um, and the, the Blue Seed Studios grant is amazing. They've got three Mohawk artists working on water quality, interpreting water quality through the arts. Um, but they also have a, a few people who grew up in mill towns um, also interpreting uh, water through the arts. So it's it's been interesting to see that, that uh, you know, the socioeconomic underserved communities um, and the uh, the culturally underserved community. So uh, this is this is a really interesting time to be be part of the Lake Champlain Basin program. Well, fantastic work. So my hats off to you all. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, I think we've chewed up enough of your agenda. <laughs> well, thank you all for the um, this sort of fire hose delivery. Um, we appreciate uh, that you shared the working draft with us and uh, requested that any members provide any input for additional comments or questions through uh, Katie and, uh, and or staff directly for those that have worked with them in the past and go directly. So thanks again, and we'll try to have folks uh, do that within the next few weeks. Um, so we've compressed our time to just 10, less than 10 minutes left to do a debrief on our legislative update and uh, uh, action plan presentations, and then just some wrap up and, and discussion around our next meeting. Just for our purposes right now, uh, April 11th would be our next meeting. I suspect that a uh, topic item would be an update on action on on the New York State Canal system. Um, we also there was some discussion about whether we we have uh, some follow up on the legislation that's going through the um, the I believe it's in the Senate right now regarding right to farm legislation that popped up in response to the nuisance litigation down in Addison County. And so we may have um, an update to see uh, where that's progressing and what some of the issues are around that. Um, I think that the some key hearings were going on during our presentation with uh, Lieutenant Governor Gray. Um, so why don't we take a few minutes, what we have left is, does anyone have any comments, questions, anything related to our presentations and uh, more importantly, follow up for us to pursue from that? We uh, note that we still have one more meeting we're trying to get in front of uh, Senate Natural Resources and are still trying to coordinate that. We hoped to do it this week, but actually haven't heard back from their staff again. So we'll press them again. Um, I saw someone's hand just pop up. Who is that? Uh, Eric. Eric. Yes. Um, hi, I, Eric. I, hi there. 
I think that uh, Senator Sears has put that right to farm bill on the wall. I think it's uh, there. And we'll okay. Start. Yeah. That's, my, know that, that's my understanding. Okay. I know that there was a, a lot of concern that it was a sort of a knee jerk response to the the Edison County lawsuit, but um, I watched some of the testimony and there was some compelling testimony about small farms really being antagonized by neighbors um, as they're trying to carry on. And um, it's it's a it's a challenge and some it's worthy of some discussion, I think, about how how uh, it might be approached. Um, obviously, one of my concerns is uh, whether or not it gives the DEC and the implementation of the RAP program um, gives an out. And if the RAPs aren't working, then what's the next uh, path? And, and pursuing changes there, yeah. we struggled for years doing that. So um, I, think, I think if there's uh, if folks are interested in any follow up on that, uh, let Katie and I know and Denise and we'll we'll see if we can put together some updates. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Any uh, uh, Lori? I think we do um, in certainly in light of the round Gobi issue, but we also just in terms of our discussions, uh, we probably want to follow up a little further about aquatic invasive species and uh, and particularly funding in the lakes and ponds program as well. And you know we didn't we didn't hear much of a response from the governor and uh, Secretary Moore in our presentations to them. Uh, and you know of course we're always it rushed going through our action plan in rapid fire and a half an hour, et cetera. So it doesn't always lend itself to dialogue. But I think, you know, certainly in, in light of our motion tonight, we do want to follow up in some way there further. And similarly, uh, in our discussions about agricultural enforcement in the governor's office, you know, Brittany noted to us that they are uh, you, uh, she's the liaison between two agencies and progress is being made. And I think, you know, we have had this long standing recommendation as a part of the CAC to try and advance uh, cooperation and have more effective uh, water quality regulation. And so I think it's just incumbent upon us to follow up on that as well. Thanks, I agree. Those were the two key items that I noted uh, during our presentations that I felt we didn't get a um, quality response and perhaps some clarity of understanding of how um, the the uh, agency might be responding. So um, any other comments? Again, thanks for everyone for participating in that. I know it takes some time out of the day, but I think we had a good diverse group of people um, focusing on the various issues and uh, it was generally well received. I did miss our conversation with Lieutenant Gray, uh, Governor Gray, and I heard that uh, it was uh, really interactive and, and, uh, and a good conversation. Um, any other comments from members? Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> no, go. Hillary's before me, and oh, okay. I've already spoken. So, hey, Hillary. Um, yeah, that was a great session. Um, it, it was really interactive, which was nice. Um, I, I actually have something about the notes I wanted to get back to. So, I don't know, Lori, if you want to go ahead of me, and then I can, if I should just say it. Um, okay, okay, sure. Then just um, quickly, some of the feedback I got that our approach this time, I think we were much more consistent in our messaging because 
as much as possible, we had sort of the same people taking one part of the action plan. So we were relaying, communicating sort of the same message throughout our presentations. And I think that, you know, was an effective way. And certainly some of the feedback I got back from just informally from um, a few people who spoke to me afterwards. Good progress. <laughs> Go ahead, Hillary. Okay. Um, I just I feel badly um, right after we voted on the minutes from last meeting. I noticed that it attributed me saying that it would be something would be disastrous. That's hopefully I didn't use that word. Um, if we could just mellow that language out a little bit. I don't know if we could vote on that at the next meeting or however, maybe something like might not work as well as expected or something a little bit less politically um, incendiary might be nice. <laughs> We'll, uh, I'll work with Katie. We'll go back and take a look at that and, and make that Thank adjustment you. for you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Hillary. Sometimes my robot brain comes on when I'm typing these up <laughs> and I didn't think about tone, so I will be more aware of <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, to, I just, I literally saw it like two seconds after we voted and I felt really bad for not having seen that earlier. No, that's good. Um, so we're we're just about to wrap up. Um, again, uh, follow up on the opportunities for action. Um, please take a look and uh, uh, provide any comments or if you have any more questions, it's a fairly high level document. Um, there's been a lot of work going into it um, and uh, the staff has been doing a really great job and pretty comprehensive in going through that. Um, and the document with the changes, um, I think, is is fairly straightforward. Um, if anyone has any more suggestions for meeting topics for the 11th, please relay that to Denise and Katie and myself, um, and we'll try to put that together. Um, we'll follow up with a, a formal language of the draft, draft re resolution on the canal system. Um, hopefully tomorrow. Um, I've got the executive committee meeting, Basin Program Executive Committee through the day, but I can work around that and hopefully we can turn that around and share that with you by the end of the day um, for ratification. And then we'll we'll send it on to the legislature and the governor. Um, and and then um, Again, we'll work on follow up on the aquatic invasive species and water quality enforcement items. Um, I'll reach out to the governor's deputy chief of staff, uh, Brittany, for some more clarity on what is that work in progress? How what have they been doing in the last six months? I think is what she suggested and um, and also on the funding within the budgeting for the aquatic invasive species. So. Um, Wayne. Yeah, Mark, maybe at the next meeting we should probably have a discussion about meeting format. <clears throat> you know, as things start to open up, I don't know, maybe the majority of people prefer to keep this virtual format. Um, I think some of us miss the in person, but understand the travel restrictions and probably worth a, just a brief discussion of everybody to see how that looks moving forward. Yeah, thank you. I, I would love to. Do an in person meeting. I had an opportunity to go to a show at the Flynn the other night and it was remarkable even mass to just be in a venue with lots of other people around um so i i look forward to seeing all of you and uh we'll have that discussion at the next meeting i know that our um basin program meeting that eric discussed in april was supposed to be in quebec and at least the federal partners are still under restriction for travel i know that uh, uh, Vermont and New York DEC where I think are free to travel and um, the borders opening up. So hopefully within a few counties in the basin, we can all get together somewhere sometime very soon. OK, thanks again, everyone. Um, we'll be in touch again tomorrow with follow up and then a week or so later with planning for the uh, April 11th meeting and um, enjoy spring as it is approaching. 
and uh, sugaring and mud season, et cetera. And we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Bye. 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 Bye.